Um, okay, today I want to talk to you about one of the most horrible legends of British culture. It is a story that will make your blood run cold. It's a story of death, of murder, of fear and greed. All the worst things that humans are capable of, we're going to find out for the next hour. You'll never visit a hairdresser's again. You might never leave your house ever again. Don't get too scared. At the end, we will decide if the story of Sweeney Todd, the demon barber of Fleet Street, is actually true or not. We can see. Has anyone heard of Sweeney Todd? Anybody? Some of you might have heard of him because there was a very famous film about three years ago with Johnny Depp. Sweeney Todd. And there was a famous musical called Sweeney Todd. And the musical was devised in 1979. Now, if people are whispering and I'm talking, shut up! Thank you. Um, the musical is horrific. It is a story of a killer who chops his victims up. He has them ready to have a little barber, they have a shave, and then he kills them for their money. There's blood, there's gore, but there's also a love story. People are singing about it all the way through. It's very strange. But anyway, you might well have heard of this story. But could this story actually be true? It's so disgusting. It's so scary. It's so horrific that surely it's got to be fiction. Or is it? First, we have to travel back in our time machine of fun, back to the year 1740. This is the height of the Georgian period, and London was a very different city as it was, as you can imagine, to what it is now. For a start, it is the biggest city on the planet. It is also the dirtiest, the smelliest, the most disgusting, the streets are filthy, they're just filled with animal waste and human waste and the stink of it was disgusting. People are <laughs> spitting everywhere, people are going to the toilet in the street, you know, there's just no sense of anything. It's a very cruel society. If you don't have any money, it's a very difficult life for you. It's pretty awful. <laughs> As I said, the biggest city in the world. The biggest and most confusing city in the world. A tiny, tiny warren of streets right in the heart of it and spreads out bigger and wider and wider with the richest people living on the outskirts and the poorest people living right in the heart of it. The Industrial Revolution has transformed Britain and has transformed Britain into the centre of the world, the centre of the British Empire. For 50 years leading up to this date, suddenly you have factories, you have manufacturing, you have huge things and chimneys belching out smoke, <coughs> but also hundreds of thousands of people working suddenly in factories, producing pollution, producing all kinds of stuff which is sent all over the world. Britain has changed from a farming country, where pretty much farming is the only industry, to a country that is a powerhouse of industry. A, a country that's producing goods to be sold and shipped around the world. That's taking in goods from all around the world, taking them on and shipping them off centre-earth. This was London. Huge, busy, dynamic, crazy, stinking, disgusting London. Just like today. Um, the, plague, the plague has also been around. I don't know if any of you saw my lecture a couple of weeks ago, but we know that the plague pretty much dis destroys most of London in the 17th century. The plague keeps coming back until well until the end of the 17th century, and the population is down as a result of it. The plague has also changed society. If suddenly the people at the top, if your doctor is dead, if your priest is dead, if the man who bakes your bread is dead, then society starts to break down. And after the plague, that's exactly what happens. By 1740, British society is very fractured, with various groups all breaking down. It seems society is falling apart around us. It's a very awful time. 
Um, the society is very strict in its approach. At the very top of the class system, we have the aristocracy, <coughs> the upper class, a tiny, tiny minority of people who have the most money of the country, just like today. Um, we have the middle class in the middle, merchants, shop and factory owners, professional people, people who work. Underneath the biggest group, the working class. And underneath those, an underclass, beggars, thieves, prostitutes and criminals. These people are not in these three here, they're just kind of bubbling underneath. Now movement between the classes, you can never go up a class. You cannot be middle class and then become upper class. It does not happen. If you're middle class, you stay middle class for your life, unless you go down. You can move down the social ladder. You can lose all your money and your wealth and everything and have to fall down here. It's very common for people suddenly to work themselves down the ladder. And in a day when there is no such thing as government help or social security or people helping you, then a lot of people go from working class to the underclass. They've lost their job, they've got to start stealing to get some money. So it's a beautiful, beautiful, happy, friendly, lovely society in 1740 at the time. It's also incredibly dirty. There is no concept of hygiene. Why would you wash your hands? Uh, why would you wash your hands after you've been to the toilet? Like, right, do you need to? Do you? you just wipe your hand with, you know, wipe yourself with this hand, use this one for eating. It's disgusting. <laughs> this, these lovely pictures of the Thames make it look all lovely and serene and lovely. The smell of the River Thames was unbelievable. It was said that the smell of the river in the summer could make a cow unconscious. <laughs> so disgusting. The Thames is basically the biggest toilet in Europe. Everybody is just putting their rubbish straight into the Thames. There's dead animals, dead bodies, human waste everywhere. If you fell into the Thames, you'd be dead in 10 seconds. It's so disgusting. And these people, the poor people, they have to deal with all these diseases, smallpox, plague, fever, tuberculosis. There is no concept of medicine. Today we get some antibiotics if we've got illness. There's no medicine in those days. You might have to grind the blood down of a frog or something, because somebody says it's a good idea if you've got a headache. But there's no pills, there's no nothing. So if you're ill, you're fucked, basically. <laughs> and uh, if you're ill and poor, you're dead, just go, see you later. <laughs> now, also, another thing about London, not only is it dirty, smelly, crowded and disgusting, it's also got no kind of law. There is a very small police service, if a police service at all. And in fact, until the 18th and 19th century, people in this country regarded the idea of law and the idea of a police service as something that was against their rights as free people. We are free people, therefore we don't need anybody to tell us what to do, what we can do, and what we can't do. So the population is very resistant to any concept of police, or lawyers, or legal stuff. There have been attempts to get a police force. In the 10th century, the country is divided into shires, different areas, and a reeve is put in charge. It's where we get the modern word sheriff comes from. A shire reeve became a sheriff. Robin Hood, Sheriff of Nottingham, blah, 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 blah. At various points in history, there is an attempt by the army to take control and instill law on the population. In the 16th century, there's a police system called Old Charlies, who are not very good. By the end of the 17th century, the government has set up a reward system. A reward system means that if you give us a criminal, we'll give you some money. But it's very easy to play the system, and a guy called Jonathan Wilde ends up a multi-millionaire because he's giving all these criminals to the police. So, not a good system. 
And not until 1748 is the first kind of police force tried to be set up, the Bow Street Runners. But you can see 15 policemen for 30,000 criminals. So not a very effective or wide-ranging police force by any means. So, London, dirty, disgusting, filthy, smelly, disease-ridden, and also pretty lawless. If you're a criminal in London at this time, it's great. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> Into this uh, horrible world comes another problem. Gin. Do we like a gin and tonic? Do we like a gin and tonic? Yes. Friday afternoon gin and tonic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Lovely, lovely glass, a bit of lemon or lime, you know? Very different to the gin they were drinking in the 17th century. Gin is a new drink. It comes from the Netherlands. It comes to England in about 1740. It's very popular very quickly for one reason alone. It gets you blind drunk instantly. It's like, oh, ah, you know? And if you have no money, if you have no belongings, if your family has died, then maybe all you want to do is just get absolutely drunk. And gin becomes like crack cocaine, seriously. By 1749, each Londoner, each person in London, is drinking about 63 litres of gin a year. We're talking big, big gin. I mean, it's just unbelievable. This is a very famous painting done by an artist called Hogarth, who lived in Chiswick. And this painting is called Gin Lane. And again, it's representative of the fears people had about the effects of gin. In this picture, you can see a woman here, she's got a gin bottle, her baby's just falling to the ground, she doesn't care. Um, you've got a guy here who's just got no, nothing, he's skinnier than I am, how? Uh, and he's got his gin, there's buildings falling down, there's a man hanged by the throat here. You know, there's the devil working in a, in a pawnbroker's shop, people eating the bones of a leg, you know, it's just society breaking down at every single level. I mentioned it's a very cruel society. Gin seems to foster this cruelty. It's very common, a great day out for all the family is baby dropping. If you've given birth to a baby that you don't want, or you have a baby that you just want to get rid of, you will tell all your friends that we're going to drop the baby at 2 o'clock Friday afternoon, come round. You will get a crowd of hundreds of people watching to come and see somebody throw a baby from a roof of a building onto the floor. For great fun, fantastic, hilarious. It's very common for animals to be involved in baiting, bear baiting, tie a bear to a pole, set dogs onto it. Great fun for all the family. This is the entertainment for the 18th century people, which gives you some idea of where society was coming from at that point. It's not nice at all. Into another thing, just to really set the scene. So it's dirty, disgusting, filthy, abomination, blah, 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 blah. The English are also crazy at this point. It could be the gin. It could be everything else, but it seems that in the 18th century there are a lot of English people going nuts. <laughs> this hospital is Bethlehem, the Royal Bethlehem Hospital, and was the first and biggest mental hospital built in Europe. It was actually built in the end of 1680, but by 1740 it is packed full of people. Dreadful conditions. People would pay money to come and laugh at the mad people in this hospital. Even the king is mad. This is King George II. He has a disease that means he spends 16 years of his reign locked in a cupboard because he's like, ah, just crazy. From the top of society, right the way to the bottom, it seems everybody is nuts. So much so that the French call the disease of insanity the mal anglaise, the English disease. Because everybody's so crazy in England, why wouldn't they? So, 
into this. Anybody still want to come in my time machine? 1740. Yeah, welcome to London. No? Fair enough. Into this crazy, horrible, disgusting world comes our hero. I don't know if this is gin, by the way. Um, I don't know if hero is the right word. But Sweeney is born, we don't know of the exact date, but he's born in very poor conditions. His family are from Stepney, which is in the east of London, just a bit further east from the Tower of London. They have no money. Um, his parents are gin drinkers. You know, poor Sweeney's probably abused as a child. And one night in the very cold winter of 1749, a freezing cold winter, his parents go out, disappear, and never come back. They've probably gone out, got gin, got drunk, and froze to death. There were thousands of people freezing to death in the winter of 1749. It is so cold. This leaves Sweeney in a very difficult position. If you are under 14 years old and you have no family, then you have two options available to you. One is a life of crime, stealing, robbing, prostitution. The other, if you're lucky, is to become an apprentice. And an apprentice is somebody who learns a skill next to somebody who already <coughs> does that skill. If you're an apprentice baker, you learn how to become a baker. You learn how to bake bread, da 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 da, -da. Sweeney becomes an apprentice cutler. And a cutler is someone who makes knives and forks of all signs. We call knives and forks cutlery. So a cutler is someone who makes them. And Sweeney is very lucky in that he ends up in central London in Holborn working for a cutler called John Crook. Apprentices were treated appallingly. It was very common for them to work 16, 17 hour days. They were often beaten until they did what they were told. They had very little food, they got practically no money. It's pretty awful. So, this is Sweeney. Now Sweeney, as a cutler, is learning all about knives. And he's learning all about razors for using for shaving men. At some point, he commits a crime and ends up in Newgate Prison. Now, as I said, there's no police force. So punishments tend to be very, very strict for crimes. You can have your hand chopped off for stealing a handkerchief. Because there is no police force, the punishment is very severe to try to stop people committing more crimes. Awful. Sweeney somehow ends up in Newgate Prison. Newgate was the worst of London's prisons. It was the biggest, it was the most crowded, it was the most disgusting. <coughs> and prison life was very different to prison life today. For starters, if you have money in prison, you're okay. Prison is a bit like a hotel at this point. If you can pay, you get quite a nice room, you get your food brought for you, you get your services, you might get Wi-Fi in your room, that kind of stuff. <laughs> if you can't pay, which is what most people can't, you end up in just these huge, cramped, crowded communal cells with no running water, no nothing. Awful. Newgate is famous because this is the site of the executions. <coughs> Any prisoners who wanted to be hanged or have their heads chopped off are done outside Newgate Prison. And you can see here the huge crowds that gather for an execution. Again, fun for all the family. Bring the children, watch the execution. Yay! Great candy floss? No. Um, so this is Newgate. In Newgate, Sweeney becomes the assistant of... Um, uh, a, a barber in the prison. And a barber is somebody who gives shaves and cuts hair, male hair. The, the, the barber who Sweeney works for is doing shaves for men who are going to be executed the next day. So this is their last shave before they meet God. And Sweeney, working with the barber, very quickly starts to become quite good at shaving and doing all of this. 
he's also becoming very good at stealing. While he's got this person who's going to die tomorrow, saving them, he's a... And in prison, while he's stealing, he develops a love for money and riches and realises that the way he can get these money and riches is just by taking them. It's very easy. He doesn't have to do anything. He also, while in prison, develops some engineering skills. We don't quite know how or why, but he was involved with some other job he had in prison, which meant that when he was eventually released from prison, not only is he a very skilled barber, he's also quite a skilled engineer, and he's a great thief by this point. Sweeney is released from prison, as I said, and he very quickly sets himself up as a barber surgeon. Now, this is the day before doctors and before nurses. If you had any kind of minor medical complaint, if you'd been shot in the arm and you needed to get a bullet removed, you wouldn't go to a doctor, you'd go to a barber surgeon. And not only would a barber be able to give you a shave, he'd also take your teeth out, he'd sew up wounds in your arms. A barber is much more than just a hairdresser. They do kind of minor surgery as well. Not successfully at all, I have to say. <laughs> you know, if you've got a wound, if you have been shot in the arm, then the best thing is just to chop your own arm off. Because there's really no sense of medicine in the way we know it. The big thing for these days is leeches. Anything can be cured with a leech. Cancer, you know, HIV, put a leech on your arm, let it suck your blood, I'm cured. It's nonsense, of course. And barbers, you will see today, even to this day, if you pass a barber shop, you will see a red and white stripy pole outside that represents the white of the bandages and the red of the blood that was invariably there at the same time. Have a look, there's one just on King Street as you go to Hammersmith. So Sweeney quickly sets himself up as a barber surgeon. You can see this lovely picture of someone having a tooth removed. Again, there's no anaesthetic, there's no painkiller, there's no nothing apart from gin, 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 and then you have your surgery, whatever you have done to you. Awful. Hacking your leg off with the saw with just gin to kind of keep you quiet. Like a Friday night for me. So, Sweeney starts off as a barber surgeon and quickly establishes himself in Fleet Street. Now Fleet Street today is the heart of the city of London. It's full of lawyers and um, media companies and solicitors and money firms. In 1785, Fleet Street was one of the dirtiest and roughest areas of London. A hundred years before, it was one of the nicest parts. Mm, very nice, I live in Fleet Street. By now, it's like, mm, I live in Fleet Street. <laughs> and it's called Fleet Street because the River Fleet, it's London's second biggest river, ran right the way through, just under here, into the River Thames. The River Fleet is, by this point, just a dirty river of human poo, basically. There's just a slow moving sludge of filth. You know, you wouldn't go for a swim in it. <laughs> and uh, Sweeney sets himself up as a barber surgeon quite quickly. He gets himself a little barber shop. Uh, this is the site of the shop on Fleet Street today. We have a little shop here and right in this building here used to be the site of Sweeney's um, barber shop. A little contemporary view of London. And the shop was very simple. You would just walk in, there's a parlour with a barber's chair, a little chair here for your waiting for your haircut, and that's it. There's another room out the back, but there's your customer, you'll only see this one room. This is the shop. You'll see a sign above the door that says, easy shaving for a penny, as good as you will find anywhere. He's the best. You want to shave? Get to Sweeney's. Sweeney also, when he's discovering his barber shop, discovers something else which is very interesting for him. In the cellar, the basement of his barber shop, he finds an old door, a hidden door. And he pushes through this door and he goes in and finds the crypts of the church right next door. 
The crypts are the big rooms you get under a church. They're usually filled with coffins or maybe wine, depending on the vicar. Um, but you know what I mean? These, you see them in horror films, you know, these big spooky places. Sweeney finds a huge one right next door to the basement of his barber shop. This is going to become important. With the engineering skills he finds it in prison, he then constructs himself a device for killing people, basically. His plan is to, while you're having a shave, he will kill you, steal your money, chop your body up, and then dump you in the crypt downstairs. You will never leave Sweeney's shop alive. You'd have a great shave, though. Never mind. <laughs> and he makes this chair, and he constructs a device, which means that the chair, if he pulls a lever, ha-ha, the chair will spin around and dump the person on the chair into the cellar below. It's quite a long drop into the cellar below. And usually the fall is enough to break someone's neck. Sometimes Sweeney has to go downstairs and just finish the job off as <laughs> quick as he can. So Sweeney's pretty much set up now. He's got the perfect killing machine. He's got a way of getting rid of the bodies. He can now just set himself up for stealing lots and lots of lovely things that don't belong to him. And he starts quite quickly. Disappearances start to happen around Fleet Street. A young gentleman from the country, never seen of again. An apprentice who is travelling from his workplace with some valuables given by his boss, never seen again. A broken back man, don't know what that's about. A Jewish pawnbroker carrying a lot of money, is never seen again. Thomas Shadwell, who is a local policeman, a beadle, um, is seen going into Sweeney's shop for a shave, never comes back out. But, because there is such distrust of the law, nobody trusts in the law or policemen, nobody says anything. They would rather carry on with their lives as they were rather than have the police interfere in their lives and their freedoms. So Sweeney just goes on and on and on. It's about this time that Sweeney meets the love of his life. He's a man like any other man. He's got his needs, his desires. He just wants a companion, a lady friend, someone to look after him, who he can look after too. And he finds her in this woman here. This is Marjorie Lovett. This is the only picture in existence of Mrs. Lovett. Marjorie was a widow. Her husband has died in very mysterious circumstances, it might be said, probably poisoned by Marjorie. Like Sweeney, Marjorie wants the best of life. She wants the nicest things. She wants the best clothes, the richest jewels, the best hairstyles. She hasn't got any money to pay for them, but that's fine, because other people <coughs> have money to pay for them. And like Sweeney, she also believes that it's her right to be able to steal whatever she wants from other people. Lovely couple, don't ever go for dinner at theirs, you'll leave with nothing. Um, she's also, like Sweeney, incredibly greedy, and she just wants more and more of everything. They are a perfect couple. They're like. Victoria and David Beckham of the 18th century, <laughs> but a lot more glamorous. Um, now, as their relationship flowers and blossoms and develops into something truly beautiful, they start to have a problem, because after a couple of years, the crypt that Sweeney has been hiding his bodies in is getting pretty full. There's no more space for bodies. Mrs. Lovett is a baker. She makes pies. She's very good at baking pies. She is known for her pies, actually. She's very famous for Mrs. Lovett's pies. Can you see where this is going? Can you? Yeah. So, get ready to be amazed by my scientific diagram. There we are. Um, <laughs> This is Sweeney, as I've said, the shop, Sweeney's shop, the chair into the basement. The crypt here underneath the church, 
the church of St Dunstan's up here. Crypt is now full, no more space for another body, we've got no room. I'm terribly sorry, somewhere else. Sweeney discovers a tunnel leading from the crypt into the basement of a shop in Bell Yard. This is the actual shop just here. Above the shop is a baker's, and Sweeney very quickly buys the bakery and puts Mrs. Lovett in here working. She's baking lovely, lovely pies. Sweeney, who is running out of space for his bodies, suddenly has a great idea. What's the best, most efficient way of getting rid of hiding all of this flesh, this human meat that I've got under the crypt. I know, we'll make it into pies and feed it to the population of London. That's exactly what happens. Very quickly, the fame of <coughs> Mrs. Lovett's pies spreads throughout the streets. Have you tried one of her pies? The meat is like nothing I've tasted before. Quite delicious. <laughs> Beautiful and tender meat, you know, it's boom, mm, just melts in your mouth. I don't know what it is. I think it's beef. You know? <laughs> and they have a huge business. Every lunchtime there are huge crowds outside the pie shop, desperate for another taste of these pies, whatever they are. And by now they have an efficient, effective killing machine and machine a way of getting rid of the evidence. You can imagine Sweeney, he's just pulled his trap door. He goes downstairs, finds a body. He then takes all the clothes and all the valuables, anything he can have, he takes off the body and has that for himself. The body, like a butcher, he then skins it and portions the meat off. You, know, you can imagine in this cold crypt by candlelight him doing these awful things. He then boxes the meat up into lovely little parcels, takes it to the tunnel, gives it to his wife, and mwah! Fantastic. Boom. Anybody hungry? <laughs> Have we got pie for lunch today? No. Um, so this goes on for a long time. But eventually, in the church of St. Dunstan's, the smell coming from the crypt is getting stronger and stronger and stronger. Again, people don't want to say anything for two reasons. The first reason is that they used to believe disease was spread in the air. If something smelled bad, it was bad for you. It was probably a disease. So a smell coming from the floor in this church, the vicar probably thinks, I won't say anything because they might close the church down. They might say it's diseased, so we just keep quiet. But in the summer, as it gets hotter and hotter and hotter, the smell in the church gets stronger and stronger and stronger until eventually the priest is... People in the audience, the congregants, like this. So they have to get somebody in to come and have a look at the crypt. There is an investigation. One man, one candle. Together they can do it. He goes into the crypt. The smell is disgusting. He, he can't actually bear the stench. It's so bad. He has a look like this. Everything's fine, it's okay. Oh, oh, sorry, oh, that's the first investigation. The priest is like, great, everything's fine. But the smell gets worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. And eventually, again, they have to get the, the beadle, the policeman, in to come and have a look. This time, they're a bit more prepared for what they find. They've got a couple of guys having a look. They've got more than one candle. It's genius. And in there, in this crypt, there is a huge family tomb that they can see the lid has been slightly moved. They can also smell that coming from this tomb is this stench which is uh, knock a horse out. They open the lid of this tomb. This is their words from the report piled one upon each other 
and reaching halfway up to the ceiling, so a pile like this, lay a decomposing mass of human remains, a rotting mess of bones and bits of flesh, heaped one upon another heedlessly, so just thrown onto this pile, tossed in the disgusting heap anyway, lay pieces of gaunt skeletons with pieces of flesh here and there only adhering to the bones. <laughs> This is like, I love it. This is like, I'm so weird. Uh, this is, you've got a skeleton that's still got bits of body still hanging on in, <laughs> in a pile. Heads, just human heads, just littered around like footballs, um, tumbled about, the whole enough to strike terror into the heart of any man. I mean, this is pretty disgusting stuff. Even if you've lived in London all your life at this point, to find a body, a pile of human flesh and heads and skeletons is pretty gross. But there's clearly something has happened in this crypt. Something major has kicked off in this crypt. Stop. Um, but they have no way of proving anything. Again, there is no CSI Fleet Street here. The only way to catch a criminal is to catch a criminal doing the crime. They can clearly see that this guy Sweeney Todd, with his shop just above this crypt, is your prime suspect. There's nobody else really going to be getting in that crypt and dumping these bodies in there, but they have no way of proving that it's him. And so they've got to sit and watch the shop and see what happens. This is what they do. They have a plain clothes policeman who just hangs around outside the shop, just keeping an eye on it. Watching for any customers who go in, will then follow them in just to make sure they're okay, just keeping it under tabs. They do more investigations in the cellar at the same time. And they're trying to find the bits of bones, which bits of bone belong to this bit here, that's awful. Awful job. Sweeney carries on, doesn't suspect anything, thinks everything is going fine, got me pies, got me money, got me cash, I'm great. Cheers. It's only when a naval captain is coming into the shop, he has a pearl necklace that his captain, his commanding officer, has given him to pass to his wife. He goes into the shop and quickly disappears from the shop. The pearl necklace is gone until later on. The pearl necklace turns up at a pawnbroker's, somebody who takes goods off you for cash, in Hammersmith. So Sweeney was knocking around here as well at some point. <laughs> some point. They then, the police, they then think, because this guy has disappeared, because his friend came was worried about his friend, somebody who knows someone who's disappeared, they think this might be the way that we can get him. And so one day, they raid the, the barber shop. Sweeney is quickly arrested on the ground floor. When the police go upstairs into the living areas, they find belongings, money, jewels, riches, necklaces, just so much stuff. And when, by the time they finish counting everything, they believe that it belonged to 160 people at least were killed by Sweeney and his machine. This is how long he's feeding them to the city of London. So much stuff everywhere. They also find really stuff that nobody could have known about. They find the watch that the first guy who disappeared years ago, they find that watch. Clearly, he's being a very naughty boy. At the same time, they've discovered the tunnel leading to the pie shop and at the same time that Sweeney is arrested, Mrs. Lovett is also arrested across town. When she's arrested, there is a huge group of angry people outside the pie shop, as you can imagine. Just about to have a bat. What, what's in the pie? Uh, thank you. People are very, very angry that they could have been eating other people for such a long time. Um, Sweeney and Mrs. Lovett are both taken straight to prison. Mrs. Lovett says, I knew nothing about this, it was all him, it was totally him, you know, I knew nothing at all. Sweeney says it was her, I had nothing to do with this, my life. clearly he was lying. 
Somehow, Mrs. Lovett is able to get some poison into prison and she kills herself before anything happens. <sighs> so hot. Um, <laughs> sweating, I mean. Um, and uh, Mrs. Lovett is dead, which means that the trial focuses purely on Sweeney. The trial is a sensation, as you can imagine. Quickly comes in all the newspapers. Everyone's talking about the trial of Sweeney Todd. And the trial is the first example of forensic policing being used in evidence in a court in this country. The sailor who had the pearl necklace had an injury on his thigh bone. His thigh bone was broken in two different places, a quite distinct injury. And they find this bone in the crypt. So they're able to say, this guy came into your shop with a necklace, we found his leg bone downstairs, we found the necklace upstairs, what happened to him? It's quite clear that this is the one they're going to get him on. And it doesn't take them very long to find Sweeney guilty of all the crimes he's committed. He says he's not guilty. He rages, he's furious, he says it's outrageous that he could be put in prison. It's outrageous that he could be killed for this. You know, I did nothing. I was just doing what everybody else would have done. You know, I didn't steal anything. Honestly, really, no. The night before he's due to be executed, usually what happens is you will be given a priest. A priest will come into your cell and will hear your last confession. You're also taken, if you're in Newgate, there is a tunnel from Newgate Prison to the church opposite. And you would go to the church on your last night. And in the church, there would be a black coffin at the altar. And it would only be you in the church. There'd be a policeman behind you. And you're supposed to, on your last night, looking at the coffin that's going to take your body in this church. This is when you're supposed to find your peace with God. When you ask for his, um, his forgiveness, his revenge. Sweeney, no. Nah. He doesn't want any forgiveness. I did nothing. I'm not a guilty man. I'm innocent. This is ridiculous. Take me back to the cell. They take me back to the cell. The next day, Sweeney is hanged at Newgate. Huge crowds of people have gathered. I mean, we're talking tens of thousands of people have gathered. Big screens showing the event live, you know, live satellite link up around the world. No, not really. Um, but there are lots of people there, and everybody's celebrating and cheering the fact that this horrific man has finally been caught. On the morning of his death, Sweeney walks from Newgate to the outside space. They have a tunnel designed to take you to the execution yard, and the tunnel. As you're walking along, it gets narrower and narrower and narrower. So as you're walking, you get the feeling that there's no escape. You've only got one destination. The destination is your death. He's hanged by the neck. By all accounts, he died horribly, which means that he was twitching and all <laughs> this. Sometimes what would happen if the figure was loved or had relatives people would come and pull the legs of the person to try and make them die quicker. We have a saying in English, if you say pull the other one, um, that means somebody doesn't believe what you say. It says, oh, I've, I'm married with 25 children, I'll pull the other one. You know, it means, come on, you're kidding. Pull the other one literally means pull the other leg to help a person die quicker, because it's awful. Nobody helps Sweeney. He just hangs. It takes him about 12 minutes to finally die as he's just hanging there. All the time, people, yeah, come on, kids, look at that, look at that. <laughs> <laughs> Very quickly, the story of Sweeney takes on a, a life of its own. The newspapers, as I've said, are all reporting the case of these terrible crimes and this hideous man in London. But we also have a thing called Penny Dreadfuls. Penny Dreadfuls are the tabloid newspapers of the time. They only cost a penny. Everybody reads them. And they are very quickly have these awful stories of Sweeney, what he was doing, the terrible things. And very quickly, the name Sweeney Todd 
spreads across the country as the byword for somebody evil, a bogeyman, somebody really, really horrible. Today, you can utter the name Sweeney Todd if you want to scare your children. When I was a kid, if I was misbehaving, if I wouldn't go to bed, my parents said that said, Sweeney Todd's coming to get you, get to bed. You're like, oh! well, you know? So he's very much a modern still, very much the kind of figure that we have to scare our kids with. Not that we do, of course, as a nature. Um, and <coughs> little uh, poem here, he kept a shop in <coughs> London town of fancy clients and good renown. And what if none of their souls were saved, they went to their maker impeccably shaved. So even if they died, at least they had a lovely, lovely, clean-shaven beard at the same time. In The Observer, Anna Pavord wrote this comment just after the stage play had opened, the musical. Sweeney Todd will never die. We all need bogeymen and he was bogier than the most. Huh. He's still, like Jack the Ripper, a figure that haunts our imaginations and our dreams and our fears to this day. But was the story actually true? Well, different historians will tell you different things. Certainly there was a Sweeney Todd living in London in 1749. Certainly, this Sweeney Todd did kill lots of people. And certainly, this Sweeney Todd did eat lots of his victims and fed lots of his victims to other people. It was the chair, the hundreds of victims, all of the extra stuff in the story. Is that true? We'll never know for sure. But the story of Sweeney has a tiny, tiny basis in truth somewhere. So there was a Sweeney wandering the streets of London in 1749. Don't worry. <laughs> so there we are. Your tale to scare yourself silly tonight when you go home. When you go out into London this evening, remember, Sweeney Todd isn't here anymore. You know, there's no, there's no such thing as killers or maniacs or psychos walking the streets. You're not going to end up in a pie, being fed to somebody else. I promise you. I promise you. Is that right? Yes. Good. Um, so, whatever you do this weekend, have fun. Don't eat any pies. Thank you.